Great, thank you, James. Hopefully you can all uh, see my screen as I'm sharing it uh, with you now. Yes, um, as uh, James has said, I'm going, great, thank you, James. And I'm going to talk to you about the uh, version 2.0 of the UK Rio Research Integrity Primer on research involving animals. But what I should just say right from the very start is that all opinions that I expressed today uh, and everything I talk about um, within this uh, presentation is expressing my own views, uh, but equally all the resources and links and that, that I uh, am sharing and all the topics that I'm discussing are all contained within the uh, latest version of the Research Integrity Primer. So um, anything that you want to access from my presentation, uh, then please go and download yourself a copy of the Primer and you will find it all there ready and waiting for you. Okay, so what can I tell you about the UK research? Well, uh, it's been in existence, the uh, previous version was published in February 2019, and it focuses on responsible conduct, uh, good governance, and the ethical oversight of animal use in research. So the intention has always been to periodically revise the primer to reflect um, developments within the laboratory animal sciences and to include uh, new examples of good practice and other lessons learned, which is why uh, we're bringing this revised version um, to you today. Okay, so... Um, the other thing to know is that the primer is intended as a reference tool um, to aid organizations to support the responsible use of animals in research. So as with a lot of these things, there is no one size that fits all. Um, uh, Catherine and uh, Andy will be talking about their experiences of trying to uh, manage uh, some of the issues that are covered within the primer. But irrespective, um, of uh, the different settings that you find yourselves uh, working in. I think a lot of people, when they think of animal use and research, think of it purely in terms of license controls under the Animals and Scientific Procedures Act. So with this in mind, the primer has been written to complement uh, existing guidance, um, both in terms of UK Rio. So there is already a research involving animals section within the Code of Research Conduct, but also in terms of the broader research framework. Uh, so it builds upon the minimum standards as set out within relevant uh, legislation, one of which is indeed the Animals and Scientific Procedures Act, but that's not the only uh, legislation that the primer relates to. And it also complements the requirements of the major UK research councils and charitable funding bodies, as they've set out in their documents. So you've got a, a, a copy and a, a link to the document here. And the latest version of that was published in a, April 2019. So the primer is intended um, to help um, anyone, research integrity officers, research ethics committee members, uh, and others involved in the purchasing, the sourcing, uh, or indeed the, the use or supply of animals and animal derived materials uh, for research purposes. So the main points to consider relate to local policies, procedures, management, um, oversight, training, support, all those kind of things. And I'm sure there's gonna be lots of questions relating to those various different aspects uh, this afternoon. But in short, the primary is your one-stop shop. It should hopefully be your easy to use reference guide. It provides links to relevant legislation and the funding requirements, as well as examples of uh, policies and forms that you can uh, modify and use for your own purposes, plus links to other useful tools and resources that have been developed specifically to support the implementation of contemporary best practice as it relates to the use of animals and animal derived materials for research purposes. Okay, great, Nikki. This is, I'm with you so far, but what has this got to do with research integrity? Why does it matter to uh, UK Rio? Well, obviously, James has given you a bit of context on that already, but um, a very short answer also relates to this particular document, the Concordat to support research integrity. So this was also revised in 2019, applied to all employers of researchers. So it acknowledges, as I already have done, that the implementation may vary, but the commitments apply irrespective of the researcher's uh, chosen research discipline. 
Now, traditionally, uh, the use of animals and animal derived materials is something that's always largely been handled outside of the central organizational research framework. Um, and uh, that's the kind of more typical audience that the Concordat speaks to. So this UK uh, Pri Rio Primer is intended to help bridge this gap. Uh, and if there's a disconnect to support organizations to work towards fulfilling the Concordat commitments in this specialist context. So what kind of research involving animals does the uh, UK Rio Primat cover? Well, um, of course, there is the licensed breeding, supply and use of live animals um, in scientific procedures. Uh, and the vast majority of this is regulated under the Animals in Scientific Procedures Act here in the UK. But just to be clear, not all animal use will fall under the remit of ASPA, because ASPA only covers living vertebrates other than man and uh, living cephalopods. Uh, and actually, the species that are covered are only protected once they've reached a certain point in gestation. So that might be the final third of their gestation, or it could be from the point that they hatch or indeed are capable of feeding independently. And which of those applies depends on the particular species that um, we're talking about. So this means that there's an awful lot of developmental research going on using embryonic and fetal forms that does not require license approval. So um, I'm someone, my entire PhD in developmental neurobiology was spent conducting research using animals uh, that fell outside the scope of ASPA. So I can tell you uh, that although it wasn't yesterday that I did this, I didn't go under any training to ensure that I understood legislative limits. Um, so actually, I would never have known there was a check right at the beginning. Do I need a license to carry this out? No, fine. That was the end of my knowledge of licensing uh, when. So I have no idea and I would have had no idea if I had accidentally wandered into the realms that had been covered under uh, the Act. Um, I also had no specific training requirements placed upon me in terms of my knowledge of experimental design and planning, or indeed the research models, methods and techniques that I was using. And as I say, all of this involved the use of animal derived material. Now, clearly, as I said, I didn't do my PhD last week, so I accept that things um, have changed a little. But what I do know is that when I did my PhD, I worked one to one with my supervisor. So her habits became my habits, whether they were good, bad or indifferent. But in fact, by the time I finished my uh, PhD, my supervisor had taken on another three new PhD students. Now, she did also take on a postdoc, but that's still not a one to one supervisor provide the student uh, time spent in learning how to uh, conduct research responsibly. Now, obviously, the supervision was sufficient because, uh, like my, myself, they all went on to complete successfully their PhDs. But unfortunately, you just don't know what you don't know. And I can honestly say I conducted my research to the best of my abilities um, and uh, did everything uh, as I thought was best and appropriate, but actually there are some things that if I'd known then, I would categorically tell you I would be doing differently. So, um, so obviously there are some very specific um, exceptions to ASPA, not just the uh, developmental work. So for example, ASPA doesn't cover non-experimental clinical uh, veterinary or agricultural uh, practices. It doesn't cover veterinary clinical trials, uh, nor does it cover the kind of ringing, tagging or marking of animals primarily to identify it as a specific individual. So you can get exact details on what is and isn't covered under the um, Animals and Scientific Procedures Act within the primer and also links for the Animals and Scientific Regulation Unit uh, within the Home Office that you can contact in case you have any particular queries. OK, so um, so what else do I need to tell you? Why why does it matter? You would your work fell outside the scope um, of um, ASPA. So why do we worry about it? Well, 
The funders of UK research are very clear in this regard. So this particular responsibility is because they expect the research that they fund to implement uh, standards that reflect contemporary good practice. Now, I can see that my I've had a message. So my Internet is a little unstable. So I'm just going to turn off my video for the moment and I will keep talking through. But I will I will come back and we'll bear with you. Um, so the research funders, uh, they don't actually care whether the uh, research that they are funding uh, requires a license under ASPA or not. They expect uh, all the research they fund uh, to implement the standards of contemporary good practice, uh, including when these exceed the minimum requirements of legislation and codes of practice. Uh, and uh, an interesting point for those of you working for organizations that host researchers are delivering this kind of research is that they expect the host establishments to support the researchers and associated staff to fulfill the expectations set out in this document. Um, because implementation of the principles set out in this guidance is in fact condition of receiving uh, funds from the funding bodies. So it's all part of individual researchers uh, terms and conditions. So the other thing that you need to know is that as far as the funding bodies are concerned, um, it is up to not only the researchers, but also those administering the funding to comply uh, with the principles and ensure that legal provisions are met. Um, now, this is an interesting expectation because you know, the majority of people are administering uh, funding um, have very little interaction or the majority of them have no involvement in the management and oversight of research projects involving. So this is something that you're going to struggle to meet unless you're aware of the expectation. OK, so what other kind of research activities may involve animals? Because this is uh, so people think very clearly and, and very quickly about the regulated use of animals. Um, but there are other very common uses that um, maybe don't come quite so quickly to mind. So there may be situations where researchers have collaborations outside of the UK. Um, who are conducting research involving animals or collecting animal derived material on behalf of the UK research uh, teams or indeed UK researchers have been known to travel outside of the UK to conduct research again involving animals or collecting animal derived material or indeed generating animal derived data. So here again the research funders have very clear expectations. They expect researchers and importantly the local ethics committee whether that's a standard research ethics committee or whether that is an AWERB, they expect a local ethics committee to satisfy themselves that welfare standards consistent with UK legislation and set out in the guidance are applied and maintained. And if there are any significant deviations from this, then prior permission needs to be requested from them. So please do check out the primer document uh, if this is something that is uh, relevant or of concern to you, because there are useful tools and resources uh, produced by the National Centre for the Three R's and others, uh, that there are links in the document to support you with uh, delivering this particular expectation. Now, equally, uh, UK researchers may also uh, be using animal derived materials from a range of different uh, sources. So to give you some examples um, of common um, animal derived materials that people maybe don't necessarily think of in that regard um, is uh, the use of monoclonal and polyclonal uh, commercial suppliers or indeed donated uh, research reagents. Um, and this is just a note to let you know that there are actually animal welfare concerns relating to the methods of producing animal derived um, antibodies. So um, and they're significant enough that they let the National Centre for the Three R's and indeed the Research Council's UK, now UKRI, to issue this joint statement on standards expected of suppliers uh, of antibodies to the Research Council funded establishments. More recently than this, debates have arisen surrounding the reliability and the re reproducibility of 
set to generate using antiviral antibodies. And this has also culminated in recommendation actually to avoid the use of animal derived antibodies coming out of the European Reference Laboratory. So there's a link to a correspondence here uh, uh, recently in Nature Methods, and again, a further link within the primer to the um, European Reference Laboratory recommendations. Another example of animal-derived research reagents uh, is that of supplements for in vitro cultures. So it may well be that you have research teams uh, that are uh, culturing uh, cells maybe of uh, human origin. And they're like, no, nope, it's got nothing to do with animals. But actually, there's an awful lot of in vitro cultures that are supplemented with fetal calf serum, or it's also known as fetal bovine serum. Uh, now, this is a byproduct of the dairy industry, and it is prepared from blood collected from unborn calves during slaughter. Now, again, there's both animal welfare and ethical and reproducible re reproducibility issues raised with the use of um, FCS. So again, if this is something that you know researchers at your establishment use, um, please do uh, refer to the primer and take a look at this short video produced by the uh, Netherlands National Committee for the Protection of Animals Used in Scientific Procedures uh, for more information. A third example of animal-derived um, research reagents for you that are very commonly found uh, are the kind of hormones that are used to super ovulate laboratory uh, animals. So it might be uh, that these uh, animals have been uh, genetically altered in, in some way, or it may be routine part of handling the uh, breeding practices within uh, the research setup. So this applies. Um, so pregnant mare serum or PMSG is actually used uh, for mice as well as larger species, pigs, sheep, cattle, etc. Um, it's produced by the placenta for pregnant mares and extracted from the blood of these mares. And there's currently no alternative source for this particular hormone. But again, welfare issues um, can arise. So to find out more information, again, I'll refer you back to the primer and you will find links to this particular research article. So is there anything else that we need to think about? Um, well, actually, yes, yes, there is. So researchers may also use samples of animal derived material purchased from or donated by uh, various different external sources. So it may include biobanks or uh, commercial sources or indeed um, abattoirs services or indeed sample collections um, that have been built up maybe by uh, local or international zoos. Uh, there may be uh, historical samples being stored within uh, museums or indeed there may be material from nature reserves and wildlife projects or other organizations or sometimes even members of the public will collect um, data and uh, samples uh, that they later decide they wish to donate uh, to someone to use for research purposes. Now, the potential um, issue with these, as with all other research uses of animals, is um, that the exact specifics of the ethical questions, the welfare questions will vary on a case by case basis. So to be able to true for the research funders' expectation, um, actually as organizations, there needs to be a way of identifying and overseeing and managing relevant research projects. Um, now, clearly there's time and cost implications associated with this. And as I say, there isn't one um, particular, one straight answer or solution that's gonna work uh, for everyone. Uh, and obviously Catherine and Andy are, are going to give us some ideas as to how they get a handle on it. But it is important that organizations do take the time to get a handle on it for a number of reasons. So from a reproducibility point of view, you can't have missed the concerns expressed within all sectors of the research community regarding the poor reproducibility of many published studies. Uh, and indeed, research involving the use of animals and animal derived materials is absolutely no different. There may be some variation in the specific incidents of particular causes of irreproducible research data, but the upshot is the same. The reproducibility uh, of research involving animal use in whatever form is improved when best practice 
practice standards are implemented um, because many of them are being developed with reproducibility concerns in mind. Now, reproducibility is also linked to both ethical and animal welfare concerns. So in terms of animal welfare concerns, these can relate to the source of the uh, animals or animal derived material, especially if it's outside of the UK, or it can relate to the potential for animals to experience um, pain, suffering, distress or lasting during the production or collection of animal derived material. In terms of the ethics, uh, there will be a harm benefit analysis uh, that will take into account potential welfare concerns and known reproducibility issues, um, as well as questions relating to scientific validity. And I put in brackets here the, the three V's because this has become a real focus on trying to improve the rigor of research uh, involving animals and animal derived material. So just a quick hit, the three V's are internal validity, external validity and construct validity. And there are no um, common issues with all of these different aspects uh, which are impacted upon and influenced uh, by the selection of the uh, model method and technique. Now last but not least on this list is responsibility. So the UK uh, research funders as I've already mentioned um, have uh, made it quite clear that they have the fulfillment of the expectations set out within the the conditions of the grants because they recognize the importance of implementing this best, implementing best practice or meeting expectations or working towards fulfilling them is putting themselves in a position of potential reputational risk. Um, and this can result from a poor or ill-informed judgment call, especially if the scientific, ethical and welfare concerns that relate to the sourcing or use of animal derived material and data have not been appropriately addressed. So, um, I'm aware I've overrun slightly, so I just want to encourage you all to look to uh, download a copy of the primer and use it as a thought starter for yourself or maybe others that you work with. Use it to inform and trigger conversations within your organizations regarding the specific points it covers uh, and consider how um, do a review of how your organization maybe currently addresses the management and oversight of research involving animals or animal derived materials. Um, use it to try and identify any gaps or opportunities to improve. Uh, and think about reflecting upon what you as an organization could do differently and what you would need to uh, be able to do to make these changes happen. So um, obviously, if you'd appreciate any further support or advice regarding uh, the aspects covered in the primer, then please do get in touch with UK Rio. Uh, but uh, you're also very welcome uh, to uh, follow me on Twitter or connect via LinkedIn. I do share all manner of useful information, tools and resources that are freely available that relate to the response of research. Um, and that brings me to the end of my presentation today. So I'll just turn my camera back on. Nikki, thank you very much. That was fascinating. And to let everyone know, again, the presentation has been recorded and the slides will be circulated afterwards, so plenty of time to revisit any of the points made. And um, we shared a link to the Animal Research Primer uh, in the chat room. We'll make sure attendees get a copy of that link as well in the follow-up emails. Okay, so we've had a few questions uh, coming already. Uh, we had, okay, firstly, uh, a question in the chat stream, uh, what advice would you give an institution where one of their researchers wants to carry out research involving animals outside of the UK? Uh, okay, so here you are, um, you're very lucky actually. So you need to, first off, you need to find out who that researcher is funded by. And if it is any of the uh, funders uh, covered by the document that, and the links that we've shared with you, then obviously they're very clear. They have produced guidance. So again, in the primer, there is links to the National Centre for the Three R's web pages, where they have checklists for the uh, researchers and the ethical review committees that they can access um, depending on the species of animals that the researcher uh, might be interested in using. You can download those uh, checklists from the National Centre for the Three R's website. Um, but it kind of comes back to who's funding the research. Um, and then having identified that, 
uh, you're going to want to know what um, countries the uh, individual uh, is talking about working in. And also within the primer, we have an example form that um, organizations can use. So do download a copy of that to start. Uh, the form includes um, some example questions that you can ask and, and a format that you can modify and tweak for your own purposes um, as to the kind of information as an ethical review committee member or an organization seeking to support a researcher in that situation, what kind of information you need to think about and access to um, fulfill expectations and make an informed decision. Thank you. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, from an editor's and publisher's perspective, what questions should we be asking authors about research on samples obtained from abattoirs, etc.? Are ethical approvals likely to be required? And what should we do with articles where requirements haven't been adhered to due to lack of knowledge by the authors? Wow, okay, there's a lot in that question. Okay, so I think the first point was about sourcing of material from abattoirs. Yeah, so what so, question? As um, as I can tell you questions? that... Um, <laughs> sorry, Jane. Okay, so in terms of the abattoir-derived uh, material, so that is covered um, by the animal byproducts uh, regulation. And the oversight of that sits with the animal health unit uh, within the APHA. So under those regulations, um, any um, establishment where there is a researcher using abattoir derived materials, uh, they need to either have approval from the APHA uh, to use that material for research purposes, or they need to be registered with them. Uh, and it depends on the specifics of the case. So. Um, in the primer document, there is a link to the guidance on the animal products regulation as to when something needs to be approved and when it needs to be regulated and who to talk to there. In terms of, I think the second question was, what do you do if the relevant um, approvals and requirements aren't in place? Um, so again, the expectation would be that even if it falls outside of ASPRA as abattoir material does, that it would have undergone some kind of ethical review uh, at the local establishment le level within the local research ethics committee. Um, now, that it's entirely possible that that is something that hasn't happened. So in terms of the kind of questions that you want to ask, um, then actually it would be about finding out uh, where the abattoir it is the animal welfare standards that were applied during the slaughter of the um, animals and trying to get some kind of uh, validation uh, that actually the material that they have based the research upon is what they think it is. Um, so some kind of uh, methodology that they've used to authenticate uh, the uh, abattoir derived material um, in case there's contaminants elsewhere, that kind of thing that would be a kind of um, authenticity issue um, as well. But I, th I think, yeah, again, it's it's difficult to give much more specific advice um, than that um, without the specific details of the case. Does that help? That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, I should also note to that question, uh, depending on the size of the publishing organisation you're affiliated with or part of, many large publishers these days have central research integrity ethics and governance teams, and they can also be sought for advice. You know, as an editor or, or co editor, you shouldn't feel you have to go through these issues alone. They're normally people you can talk to about this stuff. Uh, we have another well, question. I, Sorry, go on. I was just thinking that. Just you saying that has reminded me also of the arrive guidelines. So of course, actually, that research using the animal derived material should, um, in accordance with the uh, research funders' requirements, be reported reported in adherence to the arrive guidelines. So you'd certainly want to be looking at the information that's required within that. Thank you very much. Uh, another question from the perspective of journals. Uh, to what extent do you feel we, and I presume this means people working in journals, are responsible for inquiring into the ethics and animal care in a given manuscript? 
Okay, so I guess my my viewpoint on this um, is that there's a collective responsibility, really. So it doesn't fall solely on the shoulders of um, the journal um, editors, for sure. Um, but in terms of the likely reproducibility of uh, the research that's being reported, I think that there is um, uh, definitely a, a requirement uh, to uh, check what standards have been applied because it, it will impact. So implementation of the three R's is a researcher's best weapon in minimizing those confounding factors and uncontrolled variables that are impacting really strongly on the reproducibility of um, the research data generated by um, models and studies involving the use of live animals and animal derived material. So from, you know, if from no, if not even from the ethical viewpoint, from the validity viewpoint um, of the study and the veracity, the rigor, the reproducibility, um, then I think that's something that um, does fall within the remit of uh, peer reviewers. But I think often peer reviewers are not clear as to whether journals uh, want them to look at the uh, ethics and raise any ethics and welfare concerns that they have or or quite what their roles and responsibilities are. So I think it is important that journals make clear to their peer reviewers um, what level of information and what they're expecting um, them to express opinions on. Very helpful. Thank you very much. A uh, comment from Adrian regarding uh, people in the UK wanting to do animal research abroad. Uh, he says, apologies, we missed it, but he mentioned that uh, people should, of course, uh, consult uh, regulatory authorities in the country in question, uh, as they may have different or stricter rules in place than those put in place by UK legislation. Uh, so, so in terms of contacting the regulatory bodies in the um, other countries, um, I'm not sure that there is a great deal of that that goes on, to be honest, uh, no. But if the researcher wants to conduct uh, research abroad, then they should be able to tell you what the welfare standards uh, either their collaborators apply or that the uh, regulations and the standards that they will be working to when they are out there. And then uh, you can then compare them to the UK legislation. Thank you, right. Very helpful. OK, we have a question come in asking with a link in the Q&A stream with a link to a PDF document asking for review on that response. Now, I've clicked on the link. It's a 22 page document. So I'm afraid, questioner, we won't be able to address that question during this Q&A session. We've only got a few more minutes left. But if you want to get in touch with UK Rio via the contact form our website, we are happy to comment if we can. OK, a uh, couple more questions. Uh, you mentioned when you're a PhD student, you follow the lead of your supervisor. What advice would you give an inexperienced junior researcher who's just starting out on a research project that involves animals under asthma? OK, well, if you're starting um, doing research under ASPA, then the good news is that you will be undergoing licensee training. So you will um, be there's a legal requirement for that. So you will be being told uh, what you need to uh, know to work within the legislation. Uh, but the thing I would urge you to hold uh, in your heart is that even the licensee training, actually, it just deems you to be competent to apply for a license to conduct research involving animals. Uh, and obviously, there's more to competency than just knowledge. Um, so having completed the licensee uh, training, you are then legally required to work um, under supervision uh, with the uh, license that you can uh, gain. And I would encourage you, different people are going to respond differently in different situations. So you may well be considered uh, through observation to be trained and competent, but if you don't feel confident uh, and you want to continue to work under supervision, then, then there's absolutely no problem with that. OK, so you can request to be working in the company of others for however long uh, you would like. Uh, depending on where you are, there is also specific um, courses uh, that are run specifically aimed at um, PhD students and those uh, new to conducting research involving animals to bring them up to speed with the basics of what responsible animal research is. 
if that's something that you'd be interested in, then um, again, contact me offline and I can send you the links um, for further training. Brilliant, thank you very much. Just to add to Nikki's very helpful response, I think when she said mentioned the option about continuing under supervision if you feel that that would be best for you i think there can be a kind of broad cultural attitude within the research community as a whole not limited to any discipline or field of research that as researchers we should always know the answers that it can be considered you know we may be thought badly of if we ask for help and actually i think you know it is quite a collegiate community and whatever problems you encounter uh, you will have peers and people further ahead in their careers than you who will have encountered very similar problems and they will remember what it was like. So, so if you run into problems, don't go through stuff alone, talk to people. And if you have colleagues who you should be able to talk to, but for whatever reason you can't talk to them because working relationships aren't quite as good as they should be, perhaps there'll be others that you can talk to. There will be members of relevant committees within your institutions. Every university will have a research integrity officer or team that you can go to. There's the advisory service at UK RIA. Never be afraid to ask for help if you need it. And there's no such thing as a stupid question. All questions are valid and we all need help sometimes. OK, one final question before we move on to the next speaker. Definitely. And just to add to that also within. So I was just going to say, don't forget the animal unit staff. They are the most underused yes. resource of support and local knowledge. So do uh, if you don't have support within your department, don't worry. You will have contacts within the animal units having completed your licensee training and they are there to help you. Yes, uh, we will have a follow up comment uh, from one of the attendees for junior researchers. They strongly suggest that experimental design training can be really useful. Don't just sort of necessarily blindly follow what's being done by colleagues and always speak to a statistician because they're very helpful sources of advice as well. So thank you very much for that comment. OK, uh, one final question we're asked what is the best source of information for those looking to replace animals in their research ah, okay so that's a that's a really good question um so uh, those looking at, so there are organizations that fund uh, replacement science activities here in the UK. So we've got Frame, uh, who have a laboratory up in Nottingham, Fund for Replacement of Animals in Medical Experiments. Uh, and we also have Animal Free Research uh, UK that used to be um, known as the Dr. Hadwin um, Trust, I think it was, uh, but then our Animal Free Research uh, UK. Uh, is there one place I can refer you to? No, actually, uh, replacement um, technologies now are increasingly uh, part of everyday research uh, practice. So, you know, you can find them on general searches for PubMed. I guess the most tricky thing with any of this is about knowing what to type into a search engine to get the relevant results at the end. And for that, there is a um, European reference labor laboratory EURL ECBAM um, search guide uh, specifically for alternative technologies. Um, so I would encourage you to type that into Google. So EURL hyphen ECVAM um, alternative non animal or alternative search approaches, and that should bring up the PDF document for that. Uh, and that will help you with that. But also, you know, think within your own organization. It's amazing, you know, how many uh, people are just not aware of the other kind of research that's going on outside of their individual um, research group. So do ask around. Brilliant. Thank you very much. A very helpful response. Okay, just got one final comment uh, from a couple of people in the audience saying that obviously, if research is being conducted in other countries, then researchers must check that the research is acceptable under current legislation in the host country because not all standards are universal and different countries can have different rules. Okay, so. Nikki, thank you so much for your presentation today. It was really fascinating, really good to talk to you and hear your views on both the UK guidance, but also the broader issues 
in compost and that and the lessons from your own experience. So thank you very much for your time today. Really good to have you with us. Well,